From the land of lakes, this is 10,000 Takes, brought to you by Minnesota Score Radio. Wally and Eric back for yet another week as we slice and dice the always busy, always topical, super saturated Minnesota sports scene. And as usual, plenty to get into. It's been a wild weather week. We've gone rain, snow, now things are slowly warming up. And (laughs) Major League Baseball season is upon us. It technically started last week in Seoul, South Korea with... Two games between San Diego and the L.A. Dodgers, but uh, uh, the Minnesota Twins and all the others will be in action this week for keeps. Uh, Yeah, so it begins on a daily basis from now until (laughs) early October, so buckle up for baseball, I guess would be the thing to say. And um, where your Twins are going to land, we'll see. They've got a wounded bullpen to start the season, to say the least, and, you know, to end and that's not to mention the the starting staff. So Louis Varlin jumps into that number five hole with uh, Di Sclafini out basically for the year. Caleb Thielbear is out. Johan Duran, your closer, is out. Um, the new guy they picked up, he is out from in the uh, from the uh, Orhe Polanco trade. Oh, by the way, Orhe Polanco hit about four fifty yeah. in the preseason. I, I think Seattle's <laughs> very happy uh, with Jorge Polanco, yes. although. Now the games count, so we'll see how he does. Yeah. But he should be a, a good addition. He'll be fine. They're, they're a solid team, yeah. Well, the Twins, we've said it in the past, but I think it's very true. Geography is their friend. They play in the AL Central. It's it's not a top dog division. It's not like the AL East or the NL West. There's you know some of these other AL West as well. I was going to say the AL West had their World Series champions yep. in it, right? So both Western divisions and the East, both East, really, but. Because you look at the competition that they're up against. I mean, your Cleveland Guardians, I mean, I don't want to say they can't contend because they they always seem to hang around, but they never do enough to get over the hump. They're not organizationally all in, right? I mean, I think we know that. Chicago White Sox. They're a train Yeah, they're a forest fire. (laughs) Train wreck, forest fire, (laughs) dumpster fire. Detroit is the one I would keep an eye on. Tigers could be ready to make that next move. Heck, if, if the Tigers win between 85 and 90, they might be in the race in the Central. Kansas City, probably not ready yet. Do you realize that the division hasn't had two teams over 500 <laughs> in, what, five years? Something like that? Now? Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's bad optics. It, it tends to be cyclical, but there also, I, I think, is a correlation to between payrolls and winning not that you can write a check and instantly win a world series the new york mets and la angels are you know exhibit a and b that that doesn't always work right but you do have to spend a certain amount of Of money in most cases and teams like the dodgers and the yankees and the braves and toronto they're not afraid to do that the texas rangers certainly aren't they have stepped up to the plate the last couple of years. They went out and got Jordan Montgomery late in the season, and he was a key piece. And, you know, they've added to their pitching. And Jacob staff. DeGrom, Jacob and he DeGrom. didn't even have him last season. No, he's been hurt, and he's still hurt. He's still not ready <laughs> to pitch. He's still getting paid. And he's still getting paid. Where do I sign up for that? What a gig, huh? Yeah, I want good, that one. Pretty good gig. But the big thing for the Twins, and we talked to uh, Bobby Nightingale, Twins beat writer, uh, for the Star Tribune, and he basically said the number one takeaway from spring training this year was that Byron Buxton was in center field for the most part. A few DHing here and there and a few days off, but that's pretty normal for spring training. But if he plays every day, now he still has to get better than last year. You can use the DH excuse all you want from last year and that he was still hurt and so on and so forth, but he only hit, what, 220-something. Uh, he did not have a very good year at the plate as a DH. Let's see if that all changes this year now that he can play center field. He's physically able to get out there again. You know, I, I can't imagine too many guys who would want to be a full-time DH unless they're in their late 30s. Like Nelson Cruz when he came here. Of course. And, you know, that was a good fit for Nelson because he was at the end of uh, the rope as far as the career goes. But Byron Buxton is still air quotes here, in his prime if he can stay on the field. I I think for Byron, if he has that bat at bat, to be able to go out in center field and know he can do something with the glove, that takes the pressure off the mental game of always thinking about every at bat. Because you know in baseball, you you have to flush it, right? You have a bat (laughs) at bat, you can't let it affect the next one or you're going to have another bat at bat. And I think it will help him to be in center field. There's nothing I'd like to see more than Byron Buxton Play 120 or more games for the Twins. And I think I speak for all of Twins territory. 
but it's on him to go out and do it. There's a lot of skepticism about it. Yeah. Well, Hall of Famers fail 70% of the time, right? Yeah, you're right 300? about that. Yeah. Okay. All right, stick around. We're going to talk about uh, a documentary about Henry Boucher, the former Minnesota North Star. All that and more coming up. 10K Takes, your Twins ticket. When you see somebody who's a great skater, you can see in their individual rhythm. My name is Christian Grunna. I'm owner, head coach, operator, main instructor for Grunna Power Skating. We had a history of not just speed skating, but auto racing in our family, so we're always interested in being fast. I want every player that comes my way to develop their skills, but also grow confidence in themselves as a human being. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. Maya? Oh, I love your earring. Why didn't you try these? It isn't just about vision. It's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. Get away to Lakeville, Minnesota, where your family will have tons of outdoor fun. Come for the nature and stay for the thrills. Bring the bikes, swimsuits, fishing poles, and walking shoes as Lakeville boasts trails, lakes, and beaches. Plan your itinerary at visitlakeville.org today. Welcome back. 10,000 Takes continuing, and we're going to talk a whole different topic right now. Um, we're going to talk with the producer and director of this PBS special that recently aired and is now available via streaming called The Electric Indian and a fascinating tale of Henry Boucher's story. Of course, Henry Boucher um, from the War Road area and recently passed away. Joining us now is Leah Hale, and she is the producer director of said uh, special. Um, Leah, what piqued your interest to get involved with this in the first place? Native American myself, I come from the Dakota and Diné people, and I've been producing with Twin Cities PBS for the last decade. So, you know, it's really my passion to tell indigenous stories, um, especially ones that really have that hero's journey involved where it involves someone, you know, overcoming odds and obstacles and, you know, working really hard to reach their dreams. And I definitely found um, that story within Henry Boucher. And he actually was the one who uh, reached out to me back in 2018 to ask if I would be interested in producing this film for him. What did Henry Boucher mean to the Native American community uh, making it all the way to the NHL from tiny War Road, Minnesota. What, was he Jackie Robinson-like in some ways? I would definitely say so. I personally didn't grow up here in Minnesota, but just the stories that I heard over the process of making this film, you know, just hearing all the different impact stories of people from a generation that were, you know, children watching him um, on the big stage and just hearing, um, you know, that just the phrases that people described him like being an electrifying player and you know to me i feel like he was this awesome player that reached the highest levels of hockey that really made an impact and became a role model for so many young native athletes and i just really feel honored and privileged to bring a new generation of viewers to a hero of our past that definitely not only made an impact then, but is making an impact now. Now we know, as I mentioned, uh, Henry Boucher uh, passed away recently, but prior to that, he was still heavily involved, as you know, and I, uh, this may be a spoiler alert here because I have not seen the special yet. I plan to watch it here uh, on the PBS streaming app. But he was heavily involved in saving the name, the Warriors name for War Road High School, as he was um, one of those who spoke in front of the Minnesota State Legislature. And I thought that that was very important because we know how um, important that 
part of the country and that part of the state was to him, and particularly War Road. There, there's such a great history in War Road, and for that to be taken away, um, and he thought it was the wrong thing to do, and he made he made it known, and thank goodness the state legislature agreed with him. Yes, I do agree. Henry was also a great um, supporter and advocate for, I believe it's Native against um, racism in the media. So some people may think that it's ironic that, you know, he did his best to save this Native logo for the War Road Warriors. But at the same time, I really like the thinking that was behind it. And to me personally, I think it's important that if a community is going to embrace a logo as such, then it's important that that community is accountable to making sure that there's space for Native players and that they're always going to be welcome there and respected. And not only that, but Henry was also a great advocate in getting the history taught into the local school system and really became, you know, an advocate for just um, making War Road a place for Native people to thrive. Um, so I just thought that, you know, that was a really smart thing for him to do on his part to utilize, you know, his name, his prestige and his legacy to make a space for Native, not only at that time, but for future Native people to feel welcome to play there. So Leia, Henry Boucher is with the Minnesota North Stars. He's a rising star in the NHL, and then it suddenly comes to a crashing end. Stick in the eye, Dave Forbes, Boston. Uh, very ugly incident at the time. But as, as the water went under the bridge, uh, based on what I've seen in the trailer, uh, Henry Boucher and Dave Forbes eventually met. And forgiveness, am I, am I right to say that Henry Boucher got past that? It ended his career, so it was a big deal. Yeah, so it was interesting once we had our premiere in the War Road community, I learned from his um, youngest daughter, Bridget Boucher, that Henry, in fact, got to reunite with Dave Forbes about two years ago. And this was actually um, after the fact that we did a lot of our principal filming. So it wasn't included into the documentary, but just learning that story afterwards just really amazed me that you know, he just, the story was that he got to reunite with him and he was very kind to him and he gave him a hug and, you know, he was very forgiving. So it was just, to me, shows his character and shows that he, you know, didn't have any remorse or regret and that he was just, you know, a loving and humble person. So to me, that just shows his overall character of who he was as a person. Having not grown up here and not really knowing much about Henry Boucher coming into this until you were contacted, until you got involved, what was the most fascinating part about this story to you personally? I really fell in love with, I guess you can say the third act of his story is what happened after the eye injury. And really it's a story of hope and resiliency of someone, you know, digging deep down within themselves and finding in that true identity and what's most important to them. And to Henry, that was, you know, finding his cultural identity and doing his best to learn that and to reclaim that and utilizing those lessons and values that he learned throughout his career to give back to his own community where he eventually went home and became a coach, became the head of the American Indian Parent Committee. You know, he served on many task force that involved, um, you know, welcoming people of color into the sport of hockey. And he was just a great advocate on many different platforms and, you know, educational, um, getting the history taught into the school, the language. So he was just, I think, an awesome advocate for everyone and really did his best to promote not only the physical act of playing sports, but the idea and the virtues that go within it when it comes to him respect, humility, and, you know, just doing your best to treat others the way you want to be treated. To, to me, that was the most memorable part of the experience of making the film and, and the part of the film that I love, which is what happened after the, the eye injury. Yeah. Did Henry break down 
barriers, stereotypes, especially northern Minnesota. I, I mean, there's there's been some you know acrimony between natives and whites for decades. But but all of a sudden he gets on the ice. He's the electric Indian. Sports tends to be the great equalizer, doesn't it? Yeah, I would say so. To me, he was such he was really awesome at embracing those stereotypes. In the film, he really utilized the idea of placing a headband on and how somebody maybe non-native could see that as a stereotype of wearing a headband and kind of connecting that to a native image. But for him, he took that image and he embraced it, you know, and it became a, a symbol of pride for him. And it became something that a lot of native people could recognize, um, you know, of him just the act of wearing something that looked native really made him stand out from the rest. And it made native people proud to see that. And in one part of the film, he said that he was even contacted by the American Indian movement because during the height of his career was was the height of the Red Power movement. So they actually, some of the leaders contacted him during this time and, you know, were, were asking him to show support for um, their endeavors as well. So he was actually called upon to, to kind of be that representation of Native people that made it to mainstream sports. How much input uh, did he have? I know you've been working on this project for a while. How much input did he have into the actual uh, film, The Electric Indian? Yeah, he had a great amount of input when I first met him. It was really a, a easy process in the beginning and the development phase because he had so much of the work already done. You know, he had a really nice written treatment done of his stories, all of the moments that he wanted to include in the film. And he had a great collection of archival footage of his past games and, you know, everything from the Olympics to um, Detroit Red Wings to, you know, some the, the eye injury itself. So he did, um, you know, a, quite a bit of work in, before he came to me. So it was definitely a great collaboration with him involved. So he was okay with the name War Road Warriors. What do you think Henry Boucher would say about changing Washington Redskins to Commanders or Cleveland Indians to Guardians or some of the things we have going on in, in other sports? Yeah, I would. I, um, I can't speak for him, but I would definitely say he would be in support of those name changes just because of the direct derogatory um, names that are associated or meanings that are associated with the word Redskins. So to me, I think they just Warriors has definitely a completely different um, connotation to Redskins. You know, Warrior it could be, you know, anyone that stands up for the people, anyone that is a protector. And that could be from all races. We have warriors within all of our within all of our communities and places that we come from. So to me, I think he would he would have definitely been against kind of those names that bring about racism or past connections to slurs in the past. But I definitely think th um, he knew the difference and he knew, you know, what would benefit out of keeping a name like Warriors opposed to something that was complete opposite. Well, Leah, we do appreciate uh, you coming on with us. We appreciate what you've done with this uh, particular piece, and we'll encourage folks to uh, check it out on the PBS app. They can stream it uh, from now until whenever streaming fails at some point in the future. But we do appreciate <laughs> you coming on. Thanks, Thank Leah. you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. She's Leah Hale. She is the producer and director of the PBS special, The Electric Indian, about Henry Boucher's life and times. Back with more here on 10,000 Takes after this time out. See you. Let your adventure begin in Lakeville, Minnesota. We have over 90 places to grab a bite to eat, and we're close to the Mall of America, Valley Fair, and the Minnesota Zoo, plus hotel packages and great rates. Visit Lakeville. We're serious about fun all year round. When you see somebody who's a great skater, you can see in their individual rhythm. My name is Christian Grunna. I am owner, head coach, operator, main instructor for Grunna Power Skating. We had a history of not just speed skating, but auto racing in our family, so always interested in being fast. 
I want every player that comes my way to develop their skills, but also grow confidence in themselves as a human being. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. <laughs> Maya? Oh, I love your earring. Why didn't you try these? It isn't just about vision. It's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. 10,000 takes, Wally and Eric. Did you come from a funeral? I see you're dressed in all black. And, and I was thinking it might have been uh, the Wilds post-mortem uh, wow. because this squad, as good as they have been during streaks since the All-Star break, um, I don't know. Unless they run the table here through the middle of April, I don't think that they're going to be in the playoffs. Well, they're they're in the middle of a long homestand. I think it's six games where they – Basically, have to make hay while the sun is shining. Win them all, and be, yeah, and, and do it in regulation too. They got a huge game on Saturday against Vegas. That that's really the team they're focused on catching if they can. They're now behind St. Louis at least at the start of the week. They were they they had two games recently with St. Louis where they got one point and the Blues got four. That stings. And no. they think they have a shot at the L.A. Kings, but boy, based on what happened last week out there in they got shut so out. Six Cal, yeah, what kind of shot was that? Yeah, I mean they they didn't didn't compete that night, so they're still in it. But it, I just feel like they're not going to have enough. Yeah, I don't think that they they've dug themselves such a big hole first at the beginning of the season, and then with that streak in what was it December where they. What are one seven and one or something like that out of nine games and with all those guys injured and it just uh, it's that it doesn't add up to success. Now we'll see how, if they and how they approach the off season. They still have one more year to get through this yeah. salary cap issue that was created uh, the, the uh, Paris Zach Parisi Ryan Suter deal. So still fighting that off. It's it's interesting because when that deal happened, I remember it was July 4th. Well, I remember whatever year it was about 100 degrees outside and all of a sudden we're in hockey mode. Everybody was giddy about it. And I I don't think the Wild made the wrong move there because they had to get back on the radar here in the market, the Twin Cities. Certainly you can question the length of the contracts. They <laughs> definitely <years>. overpaid <laughs> for both those guys, but they really got very little bang for their buck. How many All-Star games did those guys play in with Minnesota? I think Suter played in one. Yeah. But as was pointed out to us, they have made the playoffs 10 of the last 11 years, one of only two teams in the NHL. Oh, yeah, an amazing stat, and they haven't done a lot with that, have they? No, they have done very <laughs> little with that. Okay, uh, the other team this time of year to be talking about, of course, your Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, and they have played well despite injuries, despite the injury to basically their second best player, you could argue. Carl Anthony Towns has been out now. Uh, they have played well without him. We don't know exactly when he's going to come back. It'll be at least another couple weeks. He's been out two weeks. And they're saying at least two more and probably even a little longer than that. I would suspect that if he is physically able by the end of the regular season, they may just hold off until the playoffs before they use him again. What I like about this team is they've got swag. You know, uh, last week, you were at the game, I was at the game. They're playing Denver. Denver's the reigning NBA champs. Minnesota's down Nas Reed, down Rudy G, down Cat. Those guys aren't playing. All three of them and were the out, yeah. T-Wolves, and there's no moral victories, but the T-Wolves took it down to the final seconds. Ant missed a three ball that would have tied the game and sent it into overtime. But they just puffed out their chest and said, we're still going to compete with you, Denver, and we might beat you, even though they did not. And they've gotten some huge wins without Cat. I mean, Indiana on the road. That was a big one. You know, they took down your Cleveland Cavaliers the other night. So they've come out and done some good things. I think they're a very confident group. Uh, they're dangerous. They're, yeah. th this might be their year. Who knows? It might be their year. Well, well, we shall see. Time will tell. Time will also tell what his take of the day is going to be. We'll find that out next. You're watching 10,000 Takes. Stay with us. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. Oh, 
Maya. Oh, I love your earring. Why didn't you try these? It isn't just about vision. It's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. Finding the ideal place to stay is important for business travelers. Lakeville, Minnesota is conveniently located off I-35, just south of the Twin Cities with a variety of hotel choices. Lakeville offers convenient amenities such as shopping, walking trails, golf, and more. Our unique meeting spaces, historic downtown, live music, and over 60 dining options are sure to impress. Book your next stay in Lakeville and experience convenience, comfort, and quality. Find your perfect hotel at visitlakeville.org. 10K Takes on television as we wrap up yet another episode. All right, what in the name of Gail Sayers, Devin Hester, or Cordero Patterson is going on with the NFL <laughs> and these goofy new kickoff rules? Oh, now we're taking rules and tips from the XFL. What is, that's all you need to know. <laughs> They're trying to get kickoff returns back into football because basically there have been no kickoff returns the last few years. Everybody just kicks it through the end zone and they put the ball on the 25. Well, now... I mean, they're moving the ball. They're going to keep it at the 35, but the kickoff team is going to line up at the 40, and then the return the return team can have two guys behind the 10, and yada yada yada, all this nonsense. And by the way, Cordero is now a uh, Pittsburgh Steeler. Oh, by the way, wow, Steelers are loading up. <laughs> yes, they are. Yeah, I, I, the NFL is just over the top on all these changes, and I think this is. Designed, obviously, to get more kickoff of returns. Course. And not only more returns, but more splash plays, more kickoffs to the house for touchdowns. And that's fine. But create a different rule book for these future returns because they won't compare to what Gail Sayers did or Cordero did back in the day or Devin Hester. This is going to be a lot easier if you're a return guy. No question. A lot of standing. You might be put back to take oh, a boy. few for the Browns. Yeah, okay. Uh, time for takes, I think. Right? All right, yeah. What about uh, your mood? Granky Yankee, uh, Grumpy Guardian, Happy Camper, Demanding Diva, what is it? Well, if you're an NFL fan, uh, you might be a better <laughs> because uh, there's a lot of legalized betting around the U.S. And, of course, they got, what, the Draft Kings and all the fantasy football and baseball and hockey and NBA all kinds of betting going on. Heck, the states that surround us have betting. You can go over to Wisconsin and bet on sports. You can go over to North Dakota. You can go to Iowa. All these places you can bet on sports. Well, not yet in Minnesota. And maybe we should think twice about letting that happen in Minnesota. Former golfer J.B. Bickerstaff, who is now the head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers, says he has gotten threats because of a point spread or his team didn't do well enough or whatever the case may be. You know that these leagues, the NBA, NHL, heck, ESPN has their own app now. ESPN Bets is their own app. They are asking for trouble, and it's just the beginning, folks. If you think one coach has gotten threatened, don't think that players haven't gotten threatened or bribed or whatever the case may be. I would say walk carefully because you may be walking into something that you are not prepared to deal with. And the mood meter says, demanding diva, yeah. Mm -hmm. Slippery slope, and yes, they're already is. sliding down it. <laughs> All right, uh, well, the NFL, we know nothing is sacred. They've played games on Christmas Day in the past, but usually that's been a Friday, a Saturday, a Sunday, maybe even a Monday. Well, how about Christmas 2024? It falls on hump day. It's a Wednesday. That should be the one NFL-free day of any week. But no, The Shield says we're going to bigfoot the NBA, which usually dominates TV on Christmas. We're going to play two games on Christmas Day. They're going to force teams to play on a Saturday, then show up and play on a Wednesday and play again on a Sunday. The same league that talks about safety. What a bunch of hypocrites. The NFL, <laughs> you need to check yourself. We're getting too much of the shield. I never thought I'd say that. Yeah, don't worry about it, man. They don't tackle anyways. That's true. That's On that point. note, let's FedEx out our thank yous. David Weld, Paul Langfellow, uh, Leia Hale. For Wally, I'm Eric saying so long. This is 10K Takes, your sports ticket.